Russia, the cold land of the bear, often featured in media, especially of late. From humble beginnings, the Russians established the largest single country on earth and accomplished some of the greatest technological achievements of man. The Russian language is spoken by hundreds of millions and boasts a renowned literary tradition. One of the last European peoples to have been Christianized, in recent times they also lay claim to the largest European pagan religious movement with millions of adherents. Through communist revolution, the ravages of war and tyranny, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it has emerged as a traditionalist-leaning power that is held up as an adversary of the West, and which now has European and American leaders in a frenzy. What are the origins of these European peoples, whose lands extend as far as the rising sun? Who really are the Russians? Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. And much thanks to all of my supporters. In the darkest hours for Russia during the Second World War, as the Soviet propagandists desperately worked to mobilize the Russian people to fight, only a small amount of that propaganda had to do with socialism. The vast majority appealed to the honor of victory, the shame and pain of defeat, and to spiritual concepts like the motherland. In the most perilous moments, the communists, breaking with their aversion to such pre-modern ideas, depicted the medieval warrior kings of the Slavs, pressing the Russians to fight with the spirit of their ancestors, their people. Even the communist propagandist in the most desperate time knew that this was a powerful motivating force for the Russians. But it was not only the communists. Russian emigrants who had fled the communists likewise represented their ideals in the guise of ancient warriors who liberate the goddess of the land, Mother Russia. But who are these ancestors? As early as the first century AD, the Roman writer Tacitus makes reference to a people called the Veneti, who lived near the Baltic Sea, whom he describes as Germanic in their way of life, but differing from them in language and being mixed with the Sarmatians, a European Iranic speaking group that occupied parts of Eastern and Central Europe during the time of the Roman Empire. In the Getica, Written in 551, Jordanes, a Byzantine of Gothic origin, states that north of Dacia resides the populous Veneti, who go by many clan names, but that principally they are known as the Antes and the Sclavi, that they are all derived from the same people and spoke the same language. While there is some disagreement as to the etymology of Antes, there is common agreement that Sklaveni, or Sklavi, is a rendering of the same ethno-linguistic term still used to refer to the same people, Slavs. The word is likely a linguistic identifier. For instance, Slovo means word in most Slavic languages, and is related to other words like Slushet, meaning listen, Slishet, meaning to hear, so the name Slav is a way of identifying someone who can hear and understand one another, and gives rise to names like Slovenia or Slovakia, meaning in origin those who speak a shared language. In contrast, the Czech and Slovak name for Germany is Nemetsko, which comes from the Proto-Slavic Nem, meaning mute, unable to speak, carrying a similar idea as the Greek barbaroi, barbarian, one who does not speak Greek and only says bar bar bar, or what in modern English we would probably represent as blah blah blah. 
While the Slavs are of Indo-European origin, it isn't certain which prehistoric archaeological group they emerged from, and their homeland is much debated. However, there is a strong case for Eastern Poland, Belarus, and parts of Ukraine. The language shares certain vocabulary with Germanic, but linguistically is most similar to the Baltic languages like Lithuanian, likely at one time comprising a united linguistic group called Balto-Slavic. During the migration and early medieval period, the Slavs experienced a massive expansion throughout Eastern and Central Europe and into the Balkans, largely absorbing and displacing previous populations. It was during the process of this Slavic expansion in the early medieval period that the origins of the Russians emerge. The first people in history named Rusia or Rus appear in the account of Ibn Fadlan, an Arab who was a member of an embassy to the Volga Bulgars. A proposed etymology of this is from a Finnish name for Swedes. The aristocrats of the Rus were of Nordic origin. In contrast to the slightly later accounts of Slavs and their habits of cleanliness, Ibn Fadlan did not think highly of the habits of the Rus, describing them as dirty and engaging in public sexual acts. However, he does describe interesting religious behavior that they engage in. Prayers and offerings were made to a wooden pillar with a carved face of a man in order to conduct successful trade. Meat is offered to idols with the heads suspended from them. Dogs were said to eat the meat at night which was seen as a sign that the gods had been satisfied. They hung thieves from trees and burned their honored dead in ship burials, but let the bodies of the slaves be devoured by carrion birds and dogs. After describing such an honorable funeral, Ibn is told by one of the men present, His lord sent the wind for love of him, so that he may be snatched away in the course of an hour. In other words, the god of the king sent the wind to help the fire burn. Although Ibn Fadlan does not describe the language nor give further details of names or native words used, the Rusia he describes are of Norse origin. Another account from a Persian explorer, Ahmed Ibn Rusta, traveled with the Rus to Novgorod, part of modern Russia. He states that the Rus live on a forested island that takes three days to walk around. They raid, rob, and enslave the Slavs, living off them as an oppressive ruling class. In the Baltic Sea there is such an island, and in Sweden there is a region called Roslagen, and in Finnish the name Ruotsi is used to refer to Sweden. The origin of the name Rus is adopted from a ruling elite originally made up of Swedish Vikings, who were over time absorbed into the Slavic language and culture, much like the Bulgars of Bulgaria. But this isn't just a linguistic theory, but was recorded by the Rus themselves in their own history. Our earliest account, written by an actual Slav, is the Primary Chronicle, sometimes called the Chronicle of Nestor, written by Saint Nestor. It's an early East Slavic work, written around A.D. 1113. It identifies the many different Slavic peoples, including those who dwelt around Lake Ilman and founded Novgorod. Varengians came there often, a name used to refer generally to Swedish Vikings and it was part of a trading hub from the Baltic Sea to Byzantium. Most likely, Nordic traders would head down the Volkov River to Novgorod from the Baltic Sea, which empties near St. Petersburg today. Our account from the Primary Chronicle contrasts the Varangians to the Slavs. A Varangian trader was said to have visited the Slavs of Novgorod and reported his amazement 
at their strange daily cleaning habits, detailing the banya, or the saunas, of the eastern Slavs that are still very common, especially in Russia and Belarus. Quite the opposite image to that presented of the Rus by Ibn Fadlan, which may show the cultural differences between the Slavs and the Nordic-originated Rus as they existed still during that time. The account says that the Varangians were extracting tribute from the Slavs and others who lived in the region of Novgorod, but when they drove off the Varangians, they found themselves divided and warring amongst all the tribes. About the year 860, for the sake of seeking order, they went to the Rus, which the account confirms were otherwise called Swedes, to seek a king who could rule them by law. Three brothers were given to them to be kings, with the eldest, Rurik, ruling over Novgorod, Sneos ruling Belozero, and a third, Truvar, ruling Izborsk. These locations formed the original core of the territory of the Rus, but there may be a mythical element presented here as well, as we see three brothers also establishing the city of Kiev, and other similar Indo-European parallels. Two warriors of the Rus in Novgorod, Askold and Dir, who were not related to King Rurik, obtained permission to send out south and came across Kiev, which was being dominated by the Khazars. Gathering more Russian forces, they defeated the Khazars and came to rule over Kiev. Shortly after, they waged war against the Christians of Byzantium, named in the chronicle as Sargrad, meaning City of the Caesar, which was only saved by the intervention of a storm. By 879, King Rurik was dying. He bequeathed his kingdom to Oleg, a kinsman, as his own son, Igor, was very young. Oleg soon assembled all the tribes of the regions under the control of the Rus, Slavs, Marians, Chuds, Varangians, and then went to Kiev. Through trickery, Oleg kills Dir and Askel and has them buried on the hill. Oleg then becomes ruler of Kiev and proclaimed it should be the mother of Russian cities. The Slavs and Varangians who accompanied them were henceforth all known as Rus. It is something, perhaps, that might surprise some given the modern political situation. But the fact remains that for several hundred years, Kiev was the heart and power center of the Rus and the Russian ethnic identity. By AD 900, the kingdom of the Rus had expanded from Novgorod, Russia to Kiev, and the people of that territory came to be known as Rusis, Rusin, or Russians which forms the basis of the names Russia and Belarus. Though the rulers of the Rus and the origin of the ethnonym was Swedish, at least by the time of the writing of the Chronicle of Nestor, the author, Saint Nestor, nevertheless identifies the Russians as Slavs. Some believe the elite maintained their Nordic identity for a long period of time. There are some runic inscriptions found in Russia and Ukraine, and possibly other Nordic influence. In Nordic accounts, the Rus was called Gardar. Its main power centers were Kiev and Novgorod, with Kiev gaining greatly in importance by the 11th century. A mythical account of the foundation of the city of Kiev is related where three brothers found the city. They are of the Polans, a Slavic group whose name appears to be related to the ethnic name of the Poles of Poland, said to be so named for they lived in the fields, with Pole referring to a flat or low-lying area. Yet Oleg was not satisfied even with this massive kingdom of the Rus, but sought to rise to even greater heights of power. In 904, leaving young Igor behind, he begins an assault against the Greeks, sailing down the Dnieper River from Kiev and across the Black Sea in their longships, they unleash a direct assault against Constantinople. With the city walls famously impregnable, the Rus pillage the surrounding countryside, 
devastating the lands around the city and taking many slaves. Oleg then demonstrates his ingenuity, ordering his men to affix wheels to their ships and sail them over the land so as to attack from a more favorable position. The Byzantines then agree to pay Oleg tribute, and peace was concluded with Emperors Leo and Alexander for an extensive treaty of mutual benefit. For this great victory, Oleg was referred to as a great sage. When the peace treaty was made, the Byzantines swore upon the cross to the Christian god, but the Rus swore upon their swords by Perun and Volos, god of cattle. Perun is a god of war, rule, and storms, etymologically connected to the Baltic god Perkunas. Procopius, a Greek writer in the 6th century, wrote of a South Slavic tribe, They acknowledge that one god, creator of lightning, is the only lord of all. To him do they sacrifice an ox and all sacrificial animals. This god is almost certainly Perun. Oleg then dwelt in peace, but was prophesied to die by a horse he loved. When years later he learned that the horse had died, he asked to be showed its bones. As he bragged about outliving his death, he stomped on the horse's skull. A snake came out and bit him, causing his death. His reign lasted 33 years a sacred number which also happens to be the extent of the life of Christ and Gilek Konhovar, king of Ulster. After Oleg came the rule of Igor. He resumed war with the Greeks, leading a massive campaign. Greek fire was used against them in their first attempt and they were forced to flee. But they resumed attack with even more reinforcements. Eventually, the Greeks and Rus re-establish peace and again they invoke the gods. If any of these transgressors be not baptized, may they receive help neither from God nor from Perun. May they be not protected by their own shields, but may they be slain by their own swords, laid low by their own arrows or by any of their own weapons, and may they be in bondage forever. Perun appears to always be the god invoked during the oath, and that these oaths are ultimately connected to their weapons and Perun's aid in battle, marking him out as the predominant god who oversees oaths and war. The text reiterates these oaths several times and provides detailed recitings of the oaths. That of the pagans reads, the unbaptized Ruses shall lay down their shields, their naked swords, their armlets, and their other weapons, and shall swear to all that is inscribed upon this parchment, to be faithfully observed forever, by Igor, all his boyars, and the people from the land of Rus. If any of the princes or any Russian subject, whether Christian or non-Christian, violates the terms of this instrument. He shall merit death by his own weapons and be accursed of God and of Perun because he violated his oath. So be it good that the great Prince Igor shall rightly maintain these friendly relations that they may never interrupt it. As long as the sun shines and the world endures, henceforth and forevermore. The connection of the oath to the endurance of sun and earth is similar to Celtic oaths recorded by ancient Greeks and found in Gaelic tales. Notable also is the invocation of God, Bog in Slavic, which is the same name which is used for the Christian God after Christianization, but may be used here as a pagan deity simply referred to with a generic title. Like in Norse and Celtic tradition, this may reflect the preservation of two predominant gods, one who is the progenitor god and another who is the warrior god. The tale continues. In the morning, Igor summoned the envoys and went to a hill on which there was a statue of Perun. 
The Ruses laid down their weapons, their shields, and their gold ornaments, and Igor and his people took oath, at least such as were pagans. While the Christian Ruses took oath in the church of St. Elias, St. Elias is linked to lightning, and in Greece he replaced Zeus in many of his former sacred sites, and so it seems obvious he is being used by the recently converted Christians as a stand-in for Perun. This legend provides the earliest clear account of a Slavic god in actual cult practice and shows that Perun was linked to hilltops, battle, and oaths as well as lightning and that the Slavic popularity of St. Elias is very likely rooted in the cult of Perun. Some years later, Oleg was killed while raiding the Derevlians, and his wife Olga extracted a crafty revenge upon them. It was she among the nobles who first accepted baptism, but fortunately, her son, Svatoslav, rejecting the Christian faith his mother tried to push on him. For as Saint Nestor said, To the infidel, the Christian faith is foolishness. Svatoslav grew up to be a hearty warrior, living on strips of horse flesh cooked on coals and sleeping under the sky with a saddle for a pillow. Olga became a saint upon her death pictured as a dawn goddess. The ruler who followed Svatoslav was Vladimir. He was said to have set up the idols to the main Slavic gods on a hill in Kiev, where later was built a church of St. Basil. He was said to have hundreds of concubines and to be very immoral. He considered converting to Islam, but said, Drinking is the joy of the Rus. We cannot live without that pleasure. He ended up converting to Christianity instead, and committed great dishonor when he ordered the idols destroyed and the humiliation of the idol of Perun, which was dragged by a horse, beaten with sticks, and cast into the Dnieper River. Thus it was that the Rus became Christian, dragged into it like the idol of Perun, by the decrees which commanded that all the people of Kiev had to be baptized or risk punishment. The son of Vladimir that gained power after him was the famed Yaroslav. He was the youngest, but emerged alive from a kinslaying war. He wrote laws and launched major military campaigns alongside Swedish Viking Ingvar. He married Ingegerth, the daughter of the King of Sweden and kings of Sweden likewise took Slavic wives, again emphasizing the close connections between the Swedes and the early Rus. It is even possible that the very popular Russian name Vladimir comes from, or is at least originated from the exact same origin as the Germanic name Waldemar. However, with the increasing Christianization and the eventual death of Yaroslav, the decline of the Rus began. Between the death of Yaroslav in 1054 and the death of Mstislav in 1132, the last prince to rule a united Rus from Kiev, political chaos largely reigned. After this period, many independent Rus states developed. The most significant of these states was the Novgorod Republic and they maintained strong links with the Norse. By 1169, Kiev suffered significant defeat and was sacked by a rival Rus leader, and after this, the Rus fragmented even further into an estimated 12 separate principalities. It was this political fragmentation and the invasion and occupation which followed that led to the splitting of the East Slavic peoples and eventually the modern nations of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. In 1223, the most well-known city of the descendants of the Rus today, Moscow, was little more than a small town fortified with wooden walls and a moat. The early strength of Kiev had been its location along the significant trade route, the Dnieper. 
Goods from the north would flow into Byzantium via the river networks from the Baltic Sea. But in 1204, the armies of the Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople, significantly reducing the power and wealth and thereby also greatly diminishing the importance of the trade connection. This was soon followed by the beginning of the Mongol invasion. The Kumans were a Turkic people who lived in parts of what is now southern Ukraine and to the east of the Rus. In approximately 1222, having been dealt a serious military defeat by the Mongols, the Kuman Khan requested help from the Rus, lest they all be conquered. Mstislav the Bold, his son-in-law, and possibly 17 other Rus princes, set aside their internal conflicts and marched alongside the Kumans against the encroaching Mongol army, possibly led by Subutai the Brave. On May 31, 1223, the forces of the Rus encountered the enemy along the Kalka River. The Russian forces were defeated and pursued all the way back to the Dnieper, with Mstislav being one of the few known survivors, escaping across the river on a boat. Yet despite their massive victory, the Mongols fell back, saving their occupation for later. In 1236, the Mongol army was again on the move. Under the command of Batu Khan and Subutai, they defeated the Volga Bulgars, Kumans, and Alans in only a month. They then sent an envoy to Yuri II, Prince of the Vladimir Suzdal Rus, whose power center was Rostov, and also included the settlement of Moscow. It appears a peace treaty was offered to Yuri, of which he was very suspicious, but he sent the messenger away with tribute. Despite the attempts to avoid conflict, the Mongols attacked both Suzdal and Ryazan, and put Moscow and Kolomna to the torch. Chinese siege weapons were used by the Mongols, in order to capture the Slavic fortified towns and cities, including against Kiev, which in 1240, after days of siege, was defeated. Novgorod surrendered without a fight, sparing the city from destruction, but became, like the rest of the Rus, under the Mongol yoke, forced to pay taxes to the Mongol overlords who established their presence in the lower Volga and became known as the Golden Horde. The subsequent history is extremely dense in terms of detailed events. Lithuania, which had been spared Mongol invasion and subjugation, began to gain territories in the significantly weakened states conquered by the Mongols. The Principality of Minsk, seeking to avoid Tartar domination, willingly joined the Lithuanians, and eventually Lithuania possessed much of modern-day Belarus and Ukraine, including Kiev. But persistent slave raids by the Mongols had stultifying effects on areas like Moscow. Several million slaves were brutally abducted from Russian lands over the course of the next few centuries. Some of the peoples of the Rus remained under Mongol domination for several hundred years, but others avoided direct domination, with Novgorod paying tribute, but keeping at arm's length. Minsk and other regions came under Lithuanian control instead. The rise of the power of the Grand Duchery was a threat to the Golden Horde and their subjects in Moscow. Grand Duke Algirdas launched three campaigns against Moscow from 1368 to 1372 over the city of Smolensk, one of the larger cities in the region at the time. By 1380, the Grand Duchy of Moscow had become a powerful player and was recognized by the Golden Horde as a growing threat. Prince Dmitri Donskoy decided to turn their armies in the other direction. In 1370, the Golden Horde entered into a period of crisis and decline with internal power struggles and divisions. Prince Dmitri used the opportunity to increase the power of Moscow, withholding tribute from the Horde, building up his military forces, and building alliances with other Rus states. After securing a truce with Lithuania, Dmitri assembled a massive force 
and marched to Tver in 1375, a rival Rus power center, securing their submission and a formal alliance. A year earlier, the Horde under the warlord Mamai, seeing the rapidly expanding power of Moscow, began to take punitive action. The Tartars launched raids, and in response, Prince Dmitri began a campaign against them, seizing the town of Bulgar. At the same time, the Tartars counterattacked, defeating the armies of Nizhny Novgorod. On August 11th of 1378, an army of the Mongols was defeated at the Battle of the Volzha River, where the forces of Moscow and other allied Rus were able to withstand the cavalry assault of the Mongols and counterattack decisively. Mamai sought to bolster his army with mercenaries from near and far, and in 1380, he committed to a massive attack upon Moscow. This time, he would lead the army himself. Having obtained Lithuanian support, the Mongols under Mamai were a significant force and confident of victory. There were possibly more than a hundred thousand troops, though estimates vary widely. The battle began with a duel between the two sides by their respective champions. Both died in the fight, but the Russians had chosen the battlefield to their advantage, and as the two armies clashed, they held the line for an extended period, until fatigue began to set in. Then, when the enemy was becoming exhausted, the command was given to their surprise force of cavalry to sweep around and flank them. The line of the Mongols collapsed, and the horde fled, pursued by the Russian cavalry for many miles. In some ways it was a Pyrrhic victory, for so many had died on both sides, hinted at perhaps by the mutual death of the champions. Yet it was a great moral victory for the forces of Moscow and the Rus states as a whole. Mamai escaped the battle and fled to Crimea, a stronghold of the Golden Horde. However, the other nobles defected from him, and killed him. Khan Toktamish then rose to claim full power of the Horde and wasted little time in assembling an army to defeat Moscow. In 1382, the city was besieged and for the first time the Russian forces used firearms in combat, driving the enemy back from the walls for several days. Then two lords from the Suzdal and Nizhny Novgorod Rus who were supporters of the Khan convinced the people of Moscow to open the gates and surrender, and they would not be harmed. When they did, the army marched into the city, causing a bloodbath. Over 20,000 people were killed. Dmitri was allowed to live, however, and was even reinstated to his position after swearing loyalty to the Khan. When he died in 1389, he left the rule to his son, Vasily I. While the initial attempt to break free of the Mongol rule failed, it marked a general decline in the power of the Golden Horde over the Rus, with various further rebellions. It wasn't until 1480 and the Great Stand on the Ugra River that Moscow was out from under Mongol rule for good. They had annexed the Novgorod Republic in 1478, Tver in 1485. By the 16th century, those who had formerly called themselves the Grand Princes of Moscow now called themselves the Tsar, meaning Caesar or Emperor of the Rus, Russia. Through war, marriage, and inheritance, they had come to possess, by the 1500s, much of the former lands of the Rus, but not all. Indeed, the past division of the Rus, the occupation of the Mongols, and the growth of Lithuanian power is the origin of the ethnic divides that exist in the region to the present day. In 1480, when Moscow had united with Novgorod and thrown off the Mongols, there was a desire to continue to reclaim the former lands of the Rus then held by 
Lithuania. Kiev had been held by them since the 1320s, and the regions of modern Belarus such as Minsk since shortly after the Mongol invasion. Southern regions of modern Ukraine had been under the direct rule of the Golden Horde since the Mongol conquest, for it was steppe land where they grazed their herds. The Tartar Khaganate gained control of the region after that, until into the modern period. While attempts were made to take lands in the west, they were not initially successful due to the power of Lithuania, which was supported by and later fused with the Kingdom of Poland to form the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In 1655, Smolensk and Minsk were conquered by Tsar Alexei of Russia, but they were regained by Lithuania and Poland just five years later. In 1667, the Russians again captured Smolensk and would retain it this time. Minsk, however, would remain part of Lithuania until 1793, when it was annexed peacefully by Russia. Russia gained control of Kiev in 1654, and in the Peace Treaty of 1688, signed with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as a reaction to the activities of the Ottoman Empire in southern Ukraine, Kiev and the region of Ukraine on the east bank of the Dnieper was conceded to Russia with the additional payment by Russia of 146,000 rubles. While the Tartars controlled much of the East Bank, they came under increasing Russian influence until it was incorporated into Russia in the 18th century. By the beginning of the 19th century, Russia comprised all the original lands of the Rus and had expanded far into the East as well. However, by that time, the Eastern Slavs had developed their own separate local traditions and variations of the language reflecting their political disunity over hundreds of years, as well as different influences from West and East. These local differences led to the creation of various nationalistic movements by the 20th century, and regions were eventually recognized by the Bolshevik communists with the creation of the USSR. But Russia, composing all the original territories of the Rus, existed for a longer period of time than countries like Canada or the United States. And the people of those regions have a shared ethnic origin and history. Upon the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia divided into the territories that had been created by the Bolsheviks and many peoples that had been united together in one nation for hundreds of years became divided by political boundaries. And the current situation that's unfolding today can be understood and appreciated more when we look at it with a historical lens. Well, I hope you liked the video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Thank you all for watching. And as always, stand tall. Stay at Priyama.